Hello and welcome to our channel, Tech Expert Tutorials. In this video, you will learn how to move XML formatted data in a file to an online Azure SQL Server database. We will show you how to move and store files into Azure Blob Storage accounts, how to set up credentials for FTPing those files from an external location to that account, also how to set up an Azure SQL database to store that data, and create an ETL data flow in Azure Data Factory to move and flatten the data contained in the XML file. Finally, we validate that the pipeline ran successfully, along with discussing some issues you may have along the way. We have already logged into the Azure portal. To start with, we'll create a new Azure storage account to hold the XML file we're going to process. Type in storage accounts and select the first item in the services list. Then click on create you will see a form pop up here. Select the subscription name and the resource group. We suggest creating and using the same resource group for all the services in this application. Give the storage account a unique and meaningful name. Select the region. We also suggest using the same region for all the services. Select Azure Blob Storage Data Lake Gen 2. We select standard for our demo, but for a production application, you would normally select premium for any application that needs to run quickly with low latency. Then we select locally redundant to save on costs, then click next. We will enable hierarchical namespace for added functionality in our storage account. Click next. Under networking, we select public access for this demo. In a production app, you would usually select the second item, enable from virtual networks and IP addresses for better security. Click next. Under data protection, you can enable a safer way to handle deletes, keeping a copy available for a set number of days. Here the setting is for seven days. In production, you would keep or even extend these values in case you have issues with your data being accidentally deleted. We will cover these and other settings in a future video in more detail. For this demo, we won't change these. Click on Next. Under the Encryption tab, you can set up to use the default Microsoft encryption, or you can set up your own encryption keys. Typically, the Microsoft encryption is adequate and easier to use. There are some other encryption settings here. We will leave them as is. You can add tags to help organize your services. This would be useful for searching and filtering when you have a large number of services installed. Click Next. Now, we will review and create the service. Wait for the validation to finish, then create deployment should only take a few minutes. Hit the refresh button to check on the status. Once it is complete, click on Go to Resource for some initial setup. You will see some metadata about your new service, including the disk state. Make sure it says Available. The other settings should look familiar. Click on Storage Browser. You will see some information about your storage account. We want to create a new blob container to store the XML files. Click on Blob Containers. There is a default container named Logs. This is where you would store logging data for troubleshooting. We add a new container, give it a name, and click Create. Hit Refresh until the new container shows up in the list. Now that we created a container, we will set up the SFTP account and credentials for copying external files into that container. First, we enable SFTP, which will incur some hourly costs. There is a link to learn more about the pricing for this setting. Click on the link to view the pricing and billing details. Based on our settings, including hierarchical and LRS, the cost for storage would be between 0 0.0036 and 15 cents per gigabyte per month for the first 50 terabytes. We wouldn't use Archive for an application. There are other options such as permanent storage, data transfer costs, SFTP charges, and adding indexes on blobs for quicker searching on this page. Close this page and select Enable. That was pretty quick. Now we will add a local user. Here, we set up the username and authentication method. We will use an SSH password in this demo. Click Next. Now we create the permissions for this user. We select the container we created earlier. We give it read, write, create, and optionally delete permissions. We can give the account a default landing directory. We will leave this blank for now. Click on Add. Once the account is created, we can see a screen for us to copy the password for this account. Copy to clipboard and store this somewhere safe. If we lose the password, we do have a way to regenerate one later. There are a few options available under configuration. We will leave them with the defaults. Click on our container. 
We can see several properties under the settings menu item. The main one here is the URL. This is what we use to connect to this service from an external server. Copy that and keep it in a safe location. We will be using it in a few minutes. Go back to the storage account containers, select our container and click on add a directory at the top. We use directories to keep the files in our storage account organized. Give it a name and click on save. You may need to click on refresh to see the new directory. Go back to containers and SFTP again, click on the username, then click next to go to permissions. Now we add the home or landing directory that we just created. This path includes the container name, a forward slash, and the directory name. Click save. Copy the connection string to your clipboard and save for later. Go back to overview and configuration and allow blob anonymous access, then click save. For production environment, you would not want to do this as it will make the blobs accessible to the public. This change may take additional time to become available. Click save, then refresh until it changes. Now we open a command shell. Type in SFTP and the link we copied earlier. Then we type in the password that we copied. The SFT prompt shows we connected successfully. LS shows that we have no files uploaded yet to this container and folder. PWD shows the current directory we are in. Now we are going to upload an XML file to the folder in our container. We move to the local directory that contains our XML file and log in again. We will use the put command to copy the files to the Azure storage account and upload three files there. Run ls again and now we see the three files were successfully uploaded. Quick gets us out of the SFTP application. Go back to the storage browser for our account and click on the folder that we copy the files into. We see the three files here also. If you want to make this service more secure, you can disable access except to virtual networks and IP addresses that you select. You can put them on a whitelist so they can access the storage account. Click on the second item, enable from selected networks and addresses, then add your client IP address here. Align with a virtual network you may also already have been using in Azure. Click save. Now we verify our new more secure settings in a command prompt. Okay, looks good. For the SQL database, we already created one in an earlier video. See that video for details on how to create and set up an SQL server database in Azure. Link in the description below. The next step is to create the data factory. Click on create data factory. Here you will need to select a subscription, a resource group, and give it a unique name and select your region. There's only one version available now, V2. Click Next. We can configure Git later. Click Next. Under Network, we select the defaults. For a production app, you would want a private endpoint for higher security. Click Next. We don't have our own encryption key. Leave this unchecked. Click Next. You can add tags here. Click Next. Then click Review and Create. The review passed, click on create. The setup and deployment will take a few minutes. When it's finished, click on go to resource to create a new pipeline and data flow, then click on launch studio. See our video for more details on how to create and use data factory services, link in the description below. When data factory is ready, click on the author button on the left or click on the new button and select pipeline. Here you can select a new name for the service and add a description. We will need to create two new datasets, one for the storage account and another for the SQL Server database. Click on the three ellipses on the right and select New Dataset. Look for Azure Blob Storage, click Continue, and then look for XML Format. Click on Continue. Give it a name and then click on Linked Service. Nothing appears here so we create a new one. Name the service and give it a description. We will use the default runtime, but if it is slow, you can create a more powerful runtime here with more cores, etc. For authentication, we select account key. Anonymous will cause security issues, and of the others, account key is the simplest one to authenticate with. We will be using the connection string option and using an Azure subscription. We select the subscription and the storage account we created earlier. Now we test the connection, and it worked. Click on Create. Here we set up the file path we created earlier, including the container, 
folder and file name we uploaded. For this demo, we are processing one XML file with a fixed name. We click on the Browse button and look for our path. Click OK. We can see the new data set on the left. Next, we add an activity, New Data Flow, and drag it over to the pipeline. Click on Source to set that up. We rename the output stream along with the source name. We select the storage account data set we created earlier. We want to be able to infer column types from the data. The XML data may change over time. This will accommodate those changes. We open the connection and verify we are using the correct data set. Click on Source Options and select Allow No Files Found if you want to ignore any error from the situation. You can add the input file name to the table schema and name that column here. You have a few options for the input file. You can either delete the file or move it after the pipeline is finished processing it. We select to move the file to the output folder for now. We'll change this later to a folder name processed. Ignore the warning and click OK. Note that these settings will overwrite files with the same name. Usually you would input a file with a date or a timestamp for debugging later. Here, you could select to validate the XML is formed correctly using an XML definition or XSD file. If we see errors in the data, we would want to select this. For this demo, we will leave it set to none. Click on the projection tab. The import projection is disabled. We need to select data flow debug at the top to see this enabled. This will help us to view the XML input and output later. Now click on optimize. Keep the current partitioning selected. This setting will affect how fast this runs. We have a small XML file, so there is no need to change it here. Inspect only shows the new column we added earlier. Data preview does not show anything here. To get this working, we go back to the projection tab and turn on the data flow debug. This will start up the integration runtime in debug mode. It may take a while to get the runtime started up. Note that we selected for it to only run for one hour. Once it is ready, you can see the import projection item enabled. Click on it. This will also take a few minutes. Once it is done, you will see the XML attributes and data types listed. Click on the greater than sign to see child attributes and click on Inspect and you will see the same details for the XML file. Click on Data Preview and refresh to see those details. Everything looks okay so far. Now we add another step to the data flow by clicking on the plus sign on the lower right. Select Flatten. This will take the XML format and convert it into a CSV format for loading into the SQL table. You can rename and add a description here. We will unroll the data by the record attribute as this is the XML tag where the data columns are included under. Here, we select the input XML attributes and output column names for the SQL table. You can use the Add Mapping button to add more columns to the table. For Optimize, we use Current Partitioning. Inspect shows us details on the order and column names along with data types. This time, Data Preview shows us the data in CSV format. Five columns here and the data looks correct. However, it looks like the address column needs to be renamed. We go back to the flatten settings and change it. Now it looks better. Next, we add a sync item. We rename the output stream and recreate a new dataset for the SQL database we are using. Click New and select Azure SQL Database, then click Continue. Change the name and select the link service that points to the Azure database we created earlier. We will select from an existing table, but leave the table name blank for now. Click OK. We test the connection, everything looks OK. We want to allow for schema drift, meaning the column names may change over time. Click on our new data set on the left, and here we will be selecting the schema and table names for our output table. Click on Enter manually, type in DBO for the schema, and select a name for the table. Go back to the data flow and hit the Validate button. OK. Validation passed. Now, we will publish our changes so they won't be lost if we are disconnected from Azure. It's a good idea to publish often to save your work. Click Publish. Once it's finished, go back to the pipeline and click on Debug to run the pipeline in debug mode. The status will show up below. This may take a minute or two. When it finishes, you should see a succeed or failure status. Click on the eyeglasses to get details on the pipeline run such as process time, data written, stages, and lineage. You can see details on each item in the data flow. 
You would use this information to determine how much data is being moved, how long it takes, and other metric and diagnostic information. Go to your SQL Server database and click Refresh to see the new table. Then right-click and select Top 1000 Rows. The 10 records have been inserted into your table successfully. Note that the XML file has been moved from the input folder in your container. It's in the Processed folder now. Now we will show you what happens if you run this pipeline again. Upload the file back into the input folder. Then go back and run the pipeline with debug again. The SQL table now has 20 records with duplicates. You have two options to avoid duplicates. You can either move the staging data to a data warehouse and delete it from here, or you can modify this pipeline to truncate the table each time it runs. For the second option, go back to the data flow, select the sync and select settings. You can add allow insert to update records instead of duplicating them. You would also add an alter role transformation to determine how and when to run an upsert versus an insert. However, since the sync is usually writing to a staging table, you would write a stored procedure to move this data to a permanent table in a data warehouse and truncate it from within the stored procedure. Finally, we show you how to schedule this as a job to run at the same time every day. Click on Add Trigger, choose New Edit, and select a new trigger. Give the trigger a name and description, select the schedule, change the start date to the time you want the job to run, and then select every one day and click OK. Publish to save. Now the job will run every day at 7 p.m. Click on Manage to see your scheduled jobs. All right, that's all we have for today. We covered a lot of information and left a lot out. Please stay tuned for more videos on advanced topics with Azure Data Factory, such as pipelines and data flows. As always, comments and suggestions are welcome. Please like and subscribe to our channel. See you next time.